What's up, everybody? Isaac here with Civil Engineering Academy coming at you with another fun podcast episode today. Today, as I bring in uh, or introduce this podcast episode, I just want to say that I had a really good time interviewing our next guest here, which is uh, Mark Crossfield. He's actually from the United Kingdom, so we dive into how you become a professional engineer over there. Uh, but really, Mark's bread and butter right now is career coaching. He spent 28 years as a working professional, uh, working civil engineer, um, and grew into leadership roles. Started in transportation, doing engineering, moved into project management, became manager, and uh, really grew in that role that he had. Um, later, he decided that um, he was going to work as a career coach, and he's been doing a fantastic job. He's managed a staff of 60 people. He's got tons of licenses, and uh, he's just got, there's just so much going for him. So I really enjoyed my conversation with Mark Crossfield. Uh, he is a licensed coach. He is a chartered manager. Uh, he is a professional engineer there. Uh, he's also a drummer. You got to throw that out there. So he's a really cool dude. I really enjoyed my conversations with him. He wants to help engineers find fulfillment in their careers. Find, you know, they, he wants to help you live your best life. And so he started Bravo Coaching. We talk about that. Uh, you know, why he transitioned into engineering into that. And uh, really all the tips, tools, and advice that he can share with you. We really dive into leadership roles and the mindset that you need to have as a civil engineer if you want to get into leadership, uh, if that's right for you. And I just overall had a really pleasant conversation with Mark. I think you're going to enjoy it too, and it's all coming right up after this. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another fun episode of the Civil Engineering Academy podcast. I have Mark Crossfield on. How you doing, Mark? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Isaac. All right. And Mark's with Bravo Coaching, which um, I've talked about earlier, um, but excited to have him on. You know, he's in the UK. I'm in the US, so we have to coordinate that a little bit. But, uh, you know, it's good times. So, uh, Mark, I would love for you to just kind of dive into your own background um, and really how you started this Bravo coaching program. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that opportunity. So, um, well, I'm an accredited coach, a licensed career coach, and a, a master NLP practitioner based in the UK, as you've mentioned, uh, working worldwide to help people to love their job and have a great career. However, um, I am a chartered civil engineer, and I previously led multidisciplinary highway infrastructure teams in the UK for probably for about 28 years. I was checking the date, so I was about, about right. Um, so I've been coaching wow. about 15 years, and uh, so I started Bravo Coaching in 2019, working as a full-time career coach. And now I get to help people all around the world with their careers, and I particularly enjoy working with civil engineers to support their career development. That's awesome. What are, I mean, uh, I've visited your website. It seems like you have a lot of material there. Um, what are some things that you have on the site that you're mainly helping people with, um, with their careers? Yeah, so there are, there are main, the three main challenges I find that people have in their careers. The first is they're not quite sure what they want next. They need some sort of career clarity. Mm -hmm. So I have, um, I have a package that helps with that. It's a career clarity package. Um, and then the second challenge can be about making the leap. So maybe they, they know what they want in their career, but they're having difficulty making the leap. Maybe they're having difficulty leaving the present organization or moving to a new organization, you know, going through the interview process, um, doing presentations, so, so help with that process. And then the, the, the third um, category and the third package, I suppose, is helping people to have, have an impact at work. So maybe, uh, you know, the first six months in a, in a new job, they want to have really, a really strong impact. Or maybe there's a new boss come in and they want to really up their game. So help people to, to really have an impact at work by working through with them on the, uh, on the coaching session. So yeah, those three categories probably are the cover most bases, I would say. That's great. I think uh, a lot of civil engineers are, you know, in one of those categories that at various points in their own career. I myself am a working engineer and find myself kind of going through that, um, you know, as we speak. So yeah, <laughs> it's just one yeah. of those, one of those things. 
Absolutely. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I was in that category as well. I was I was in a, you know, a really good job in terms of civil engineering, but it wasn't a good job for me. So I know what it's like to be in a role that just doesn't fit. So I want to help people to find their ideal role, one they're going to really get excited about and help them to move them to that role as quickly as possible. And right. um, so that's why I'm passionate about this, this, this work I'm doing. That's exciting. Um, so take us, I, I think a lot of people here in the US are always interested in what it's like in other countries for a civil engineer to become a professional engineer. Um, what what does that entail over there in the UK? What 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 does an engineer need to do to be you know be a working professional uh, yeah. over there? Okay, yeah, good good question. So, well, the equivalent to the professional engineer, your PE in the UK and in many other parts of the world actually is chartered engineer. So that's uh, CEng chartered engineer. Okay. So so most engineers aspire to becoming a chartered engineer and a member of the institution of civil engineers and I'll, I'll briefly tell you how you how you go about doing that and compare it with with your system so getting charted is similar to your route in that you have to do a four-year degree so in the uk you do a, a master's in engineering degree in civil engineering so i guess that's similar to to what to what you do um, so you're calling a master's a four-year degree in civil engineering is that what yeah you're calling yeah it? yeah okay. it, it, previously it was it was a three-year um uh degree but but probably about 10 years ago maybe even more than that now they changed it to you had to have a four-year de degree in civil engineering rather than a three-year okay um, so i guess here in, in the united states just so I guess everyone's aware in the US you have to get a four year bachelor's degree to be, to get your civil you know become a civil engineer um, any additional education if you if in the US if you got a master's in civil engineering it's typically an additional 2 years of schooling here in the US so that's that's interesting yeah anyway yeah. sorry keep going no that's 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 interesting to know the, the, there isn't um, there isn't really equivalent in the UK of your fundamentals of engineering exam your fe exam there isn't anything like that in the uk what happens is um once you graduate then you enter a period of uh, professional development and in the uk it's called initial professional development and i think in in i might be right in saying that it's in in the us it's four years is it and that's that's how long you Yes, and it, that actually depends on each state, but most states require four years of experience before you can actually get your license to be a professional engineer. But yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah. Okay. So four years is probably, I would say, on the on the minimum side in mm. the in the UK. Most people take a bit longer to to do their initial professional development because it involves um, you know doing lots of work with your supervising civil engineer in the organization like there's regular regular annual meetings and you have um different attributes that you need to achieve within the industry different things you need to learn about civil engineering and all those have got to be signed off before you get to the the, the final hurdle which i guess is similar to your um your your final exam your pe i guess yeah um we have a professional review process so this is a a, a final a hurdle if you like that you've, you've got a leap and that involves submitting lots of well not lots of reports a couple of reports on projects you've worked on and also about your professional development and it entails an interview and some sort of uh, you know examination at the end if you like to uh, to make sure that you've 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 achieved um what you should achieve by the the, the point you've got to the review and if you pass that then you become a, a chartered engineer in the in the uk and um, you, you then you can use the the cng moniker and um and you become a member of the institution of civil engineers awesome so i'm just curious um does this person that you've that you're working with did they become a, like a mentor to you does it trade off you know are you always working with the same person that signs off on your experience and and work or it, like i'm just curious how is there a bond there that 
maybe you be, this person becomes a mentor to you in, in what you're going through, or is it simply a, for, a for formality to to get your CNG? Yeah. So so each each organization has a supervising civil engineer. That okay. person is responsible for all the people that are going through training within that organization. So if, in bigger organizations, mm. there might be 20 people going through the process. That person is responsible for all those engineers. However, um, because that is quite a big role that the, that person has, they have uh, delegated engineers. Now, those delegated engineers do act a bit more like a mentor, actually. So they, they have a much closer relationship with the trainee making sure that they monitor and support that development. So it's quite a good uh, arrangement in many ways. They have the one person overseeing the whole thing uh, and they see the trainee once a year. And then they have a delegated engineer that will, will typically actually meet you on a quarterly basis for a formal meeting, but will probably see you in between those, those times as well. So you do get quite close mentorship in that respect. Wow, that's interesting. So I guess as a, you know, to carry on that conversation, many engineers are looking ahead to their future, obviously. Some of them want to be leaders. Some of them just want to be engineers. Um, I'm curious, what kind of hurdles do you see that are in place for engineers that want to become, become a leader? Well, I would say probably the biggest hurdle is the mindset. I think the mindset does get in the way of making that journey to becoming a manager and a leader. And I think once you you get your head around the fact that, uh, th you know, this is a moving platform we're all operating on and people are leaving the industry all the time. People retire, of course, people uh, leave the organization and therefore there's always opportunity for uh, new managers, new leaders within the organization. And actually, that is that is something that is it, you know, it's very positive to, to to know that and and I sort of think people know that but I think you have to understand that um, the, the opportunity will always be available so I think mindset is the first thing to think about so thinking about the 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 situation in your organisation but also thinking about what is possible for you and starting to think about having a possibility mindset about if you're interested in becoming a manager or a leader. Uh, cultivating that mindset that that could be possible for you at an early stage, I think is quite important because some of us perhaps don't see that early on. And to start to think about yourself in that way is quite useful such that when you, as and when you develop as a professional engineer, that you take opportunities as they arise. So I think probably, you know, leadership, uh, uh, mindset is probably the first challenge. And I, if, I, if I say a little bit about my story, so I um, I started out really as a, uh, I suppose, I, you know, as a graduate engineer, and then I started working as a, a senior engineer in an organization. And then as I started to um, develop myself, an opportunity came up to be a manager in a, in a different organization. And for, for me at the time, I remember feeling like that was, that was quite quite a big leap. And it wasn't until I actually started the role that I, I felt a bit more comfortable in that position. So I think also there is an element of sometimes you, you don't always feel ready to make that leap. And sometimes you have to make the leap. Mm -hmm. And when you arrive there, then you, you start to feel more comfortable in that position. So again, it's about mindset, really. Sometimes you, you're, you're having to overcome the mindset initially, but making that leap does help. That makes a lot of sense. I think, um, you know, I think with every step in this engineering journey, a lot of it does have to do with mindset. Um, you know, I know over here in the U.S., even passing these difficult exams is, is also a, a mindset game, too. But definitely wanting to be a leader, um, you know, sometimes engineers have their heads uh, so focused on the work, you kind of don't see what's in front of you and i like how you said this was you know everything's in motion there are people retiring people take other opportunities and um over time you know your opportunity your chance to become a leader um comes can come up very quickly so mark i was just curious what what area of engineering did you kind of go into yeah so i started out as a highway engineer originally, although I did I did actually spend a year working in railway engineering actually as well. But mm. um, 
primarily it was highway engineering. So I worked on, in the area where I live, uh, I worked in, in um, what we call local authority, and it's quite one of the bigger, bigger ones in the UK. So I had responsibility for all the highway and bridge design. And, and therefore, I, I got involved in you know, quite a few interesting projects, new, new, um, new highways, uh, new bridge projects. And uh, yeah, it was quite interesting for a while. And then I, then I started being drawn more into the, the project management side of, of that role. And then eventually a management position came up and I moved into that. Um, and that led on f further down the line to a more of a leadership role. So that that's how my development happened. Um, and I might mention later on if it comes up how that how that affected me in terms of my enjoyment in those roles and what other people might want to consider in terms of their own development. If that, that's um, great, if that's helpful. Yeah, we'll touch upon that. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can d touch upon that. I, I kind of want to go back to people that um, that are interested in becoming a, a leader in their industry, a leader in their workplace. What I mean, you talked about mindset. So, if somebody does have the mindset that they want to be a leader, what additional advice or skills uh, that could they maybe think about pursuing or focusing on in the roles that they have to help them? eventually become you know a leader when that opportunity comes up yeah yeah absolutely because there are there are skills that you can develop now and nurture that will um, will definitely help you in, in in management and leadership roles and i think one of the and there's probably three i can think of off the top of my head i mean one of the threshold skills i think is essential is public speaking i think this is such a an important skill and it's so important to be uh, competent at public speaking earlier in your career because you don't want to wait until later in your career when it's expected that you'll be good at this to to be able to um, to, to do that. So the sooner you can start to develop your public speaking skills, the better. So that's one thing. The second thing is to study how to get the best out of people. So start to recognize how people become motivated, what uh, gets people working the, in the best way and look at how other managers work with you and other people and see what works well and what doesn't work well. And then probably thirdly, become a good problem solver. So become good at solving problems in the in the workplace because if you're a good problem solver, that is a really good transferable skill to use in, in management and then in leadership because all that happens in your career is the problems just get bigger. So if you've got the skills to be able to deal with these problems when they're small, then it does make it easier to deal with them when they get bigger. And um, now when you say that, are you talking about any kind of problem or uh, like specific engineering problems or just conflicts within any project? I've, I've noticed that, um, at least in my own career, you know, engineering problems that you know, you can solve those, but it seems like the bigger conflict is maybe like communication problems that you're having with other departments or trying to get information or questions answered in different ar arenas. I mean, is that is that what you mean? Yeah, I, I suppose it's having a, a methodology to deal with problems in, in a way which is, is going to be uh, something you can use later on. So one thing you can think about is, first of all, how you define the problem. So the first thing you do with any problem, I think, is to tr try and define what the problem is. Because quite a lot of people rush in thinking they know what the problem is when they've not thought through exactly mm. what it is actually <clears throat> they're dealing with. So it, that is so transferable. You, <laughs> once, you, once you're able to define a problem, then you're off to a good start. And I think secondly, it's about then coming up with ideas to solve the problem and not necessarily um, evaluating those ideas, but just capturing as many ideas as you can, then do the analysis of of the options you've got to look at the uh, the best solution. Now, that is a simple uh, sort of three step process, but that you can apply that at any point in your career to most problems. And um, so, so having a process of of doing that it can be really helpful. Now, I know that when you start getting involved in involving lots of different people in um, problem solving, it can get a little more complex. 
But as leaders and, and your audience, of course, are future leaders, having that methodology in your head and being able to communicate that to people helps those people to become good at problem solving as well. And then, you know, once you've, you've been able to set the agenda for problem solving as a group, it becomes even easier to solve the bigger problems that might challenge you. That's awesome. I can tell you've put a lot of thought into that, and that's that's uh, that's that's a great a lot of detail there. So, thanks for sharing that. Um, I'm also curious. Um, you know, sometimes engineers don't want to be in uh, in a leadership role. Like, if if somebody's unsure whether they want to be a, a leader or they're worried about maybe even the skills that they think they that are needed. Do you think that there's any sort of test or advice that that you could give an engineer to see if maybe that would be a pathway for them or not because i feel like people don't know what they don't know and unless you take a step forward and experience something you know how, how would you ever know so i guess if an engineer is questioning whether they can even do that is there anything they that you think they could do to to test out um see if a leadership role might be the area they want to go Mm, th this is such such an important question. I'm, gl I'm glad you've asked it, actually, Isaac, because for me, there is sometimes in the industry this idea that we all gravitate towards management and then leadership, and that is the that is the right path, and that is the the path we should all be thinking about. But actually, we're all different. So I think it's about um, understanding that first of all that that is not right for everybody. Some people may want to stay as really excellent engineers. Uh, maybe maybe the actual the, the projects get bigger, but they don't particularly want to move into management or leadership. And that and that's okay as well. But so or maybe they want to be, you know, really excellent project managers and mm -hmm. the, the projects get bigger and more exciting, but they don't particularly want to move into um, a, a, a inverted commas leadership role. So first of all, knowing that there is there are different roles with engineering and civil engineering in particular, and that the industry is so um, there's so much to offer in the industry that there's you, you can find a role with that industry that best best suits you. Knowing that is is good to start off with, and I think I would I would say in terms of looking at how you can check if it's right for you, I think there's a couple of things you can think about. One is to think about your values so what is important to you about your your career and your your work and start to think about you know if you can't list those values you know what what matters to you about the, the the role and for some people you know making a difference and having an impact on a you know lots of people and uh, managing organizations and shaping the um the look of of the industry you know that can be really important to them for other people, they have different values, and maybe it's about, you know, ha having satisfaction in uh, completing engineering solutions and, you know, completing really excellent projects, but not necessarily going for yeah, roles that maybe uh, require leadership skills. So I think it's about thinking what what is important to you firstly, and then also starting to think about your skills. So. Think about what you're, in, what, what you're good at in your in your career, firstly, and also what what sort of things do you in, do you enjoy doing? I sort of gravitated to management because I, I quite like working with people. I, I was fascinated by what motivates people, and it, for me, it was a, like a natural um, inclination to to move towards management. But for other people, they might not have that same inclination that management and the skills that you require uh, as a manager might not be something that you're interested in so it's about understanding your 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 skills and your strengths i guess and also what's important to you those two things help you to understand yourself better and give you a sense of whether management and their leadership might be something that you're interested in checking out that makes a lot of sense so um, for me, I also think about lifestyle changes too. You know, I, I you know, you enjoy um, 
these, uh, if you're in a leadership role that, that might take a little more time out of your day, but you have real impact on the organization and the, and, um, the decisions that they make. And, um, you know, you have to kind of balance those things. So kind of depends on what, what you want with that. Um, speaking of leadership and all of these different roles, is there, I, I know there's a lot of different leadership styles out there. Is there any that you feel like you gravitate to or that kind of rise, rise to the top in your mind? I guess as a coach, I probably should say, uh, you know, coach style leadership is, is, is probably, uh, the, the, the most effective, I guess. Um, this is where a leader's focusing on, you know, identifying and nurturing individual strengths of each member in a team. And that can work really well on, on, uh, on, a, on a project in particular. Um, so I think that's quite, it's quite a good, uh, leadership style, but I don't think it works in every, every situation. I've also seen, uh, servant leadership. So, uh, really you become the servants of the people that are working for you and everything you do is about making their, their job easier and making mm -hmm. their, their task easier. I quite like that as well, actually, because that is about recognizing that those people that are working for you, you know, they're the people that bring the real value to the organization. And the more you can make their uh, job easier and to make their path clearer to success, the better. Um, but I also think, and it's slightly controversial this, that um, sometimes a more direct or more autocratic leadership style can be beneficial, particularly on projects where there's very little headroom in terms of time and you need to get the project finished pretty quickly. And there's not a lot of um, opportunity to have that, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, more servant leadership or the coaching style where really a more directive approach is is needed. But I would say, so I, so I think it is useful sometimes to have that. So you're Mark, being that very- that sounds like every project. <laughs> Yeah, no, and I know. I recognize that. And I think I was, I was just going on to, um, to reflect on that, but I don't necessarily think that is a good thing if that's the only style that you have. So I think that should be more of a, a, a sort of last, um, you know, last, last saloon, last chance saloon, um, style, if you like, maybe don't rely on that. Um, it, you know, it's not the ideal leadership approach to take but it, it sometimes can be useful if needed. So speaking of that, uh, this question comes up on a lot of areas, but the difference between a leader and a manager, uh, what are your thoughts surrounding that? Yeah, I think that's, um, I mean, we could probably talk for Quickly. three hours about this. Yeah, because that's such a, a big role. <laughs> so, uh, so, okay, let's think about this in terms of civ civil engineering. So let's simplify the the function down to three things actually so project planning and people so if we talk about the project i think a manager is organizing doing day-to-day -day management maybe project management whereas a leader in terms of the project bit is doing the vision for success inspiring action connecting stakeholders and thinking about the the longer term project issues if we come to the planning side then the manager is coordinating, resourcing, doing procedures, getting things done. But the, the leader is thinking about the strategy, the long-term planning, critical problem solving, thinking and innovating. And then finally, we come on to the people side. A manager is recruiting, evaluating, it's more command and control. But when you get to the leader, this is more about coaching, developing the team, and seeking followers and inspiring the team. So I've, I know I've widened the, the definition a little bit, but I think, uh, I hope that is, is helpful for your audience, Isaac. No, that's perfect. I really like how concise you made that, and I think it's spot on. And I think at some level, everybody, everybody is a leader at some level. You know, you are over your project. You are the engineer over that. And so, um, you know, at some level, everybody has leadership skills that you're going to have to develop at some point. So that's just part of being a civil engineer and the arena that you kind of got into. So good points. 
Um, as we wrap this up, Mark, is there any resources out there, books, uh, anything that you'd like to mention to the Civil Engineering Academy audience that might, they might find uh, re helpful in, in this journey? Yeah, so there's, there's, a, the, the, there's three things I would, I would um, recommend. So I mentioned public speaking earlier on, and I did listen actually to uh, your episode with Neil Thompson, and I do echo his um, sentiments about it's something you've got to do. Excellent. So, you know, you know join Toastmasters, um, get a Zoom group going, uh, join Clubhouse, practice your speaking somewhere where you can get better. So that's my first uh, tip. Secondly, study leaders. So read about what leaders do and re reflect on what good leaders around you do as well. My favorite book on leadership is actually a book called Shackleton's Way. Um, this is a uh, book by um, Dava. No, it's not by Dava. So, but sorry, it's I get the... Um, you got a copy of it there? Yeah, I've got a copy. So let me, Show, show let me, me that. And the, let me, we're recording let me show, this too. Let me show you that. So that's by yeah. Margot... Morel and Stephanie Caparel. Huh. And this is a, an amazing book because it's, it's about the Antarctic explorer, um, Ernest Shackleton, and it's leadership tips all the way through, but each chapter has summarized advice on leadership. So it's an mm. excellent book to read. The, the final tip is about problem solving. And the, the book or the audio program I would recommend is called your deceptive mind a scientific guide to critical thinking skills um, by Stephen novella and i got this on audible although you can you can buy the book actually but the audible uh, series is excellent and uh, this is a really good way to understand how your thinking skills work and how you can sharpen your thinking skills so i recommend that those three resources for your audience those are great. We'll link all that in our show notes and make sure everyone's aware of them. So um, I have I have yet to either listen to that or read that other book. So I will, I'm going to dive into those as well. So those, those, those are great. Well, Mark, I appreciate it. Uh, what's the best way for people to reach out to you, connect with you, uh, if they you know need want to career coaching or any of your other tips and advice? I I want them to connect with you. So what's the best way to do that? Yeah, sure. So I'm on LinkedIn, so people can find me there. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, but I mean, my website is uh, bravocoaching.co.uk. And on the website, it, it talks about what I can do and what I can help you with, my career coaching, but also my podcast, which is called Your Bravo Career. So if you're interested in finding out more about how you can love your job and have a great career, then maybe subscribe to the podcast. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you jumping on. Uh, I You've shared a ton of tips with us, and um, I can just tell that th this is your bread and butter. This is your forte, and uh, you really enjoy this. So I really do appreciate you jumping on. Thanks, Isaac. I really All appreciate right. you having me on your show. Yeah, thanks. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye.